function of the flow control valve is to reduce the rate of flow in its leg of the circuit. Flow reduction will result in speed reduction at the actuator. A flow control valve builds added resistance to the circuit, increasing pressure, resulting in a partial bypassing of fluid over the relief valve, or a destroking pressure of a compensated pump. This reduces flow downstream of the flow control valve. This circuit uses a fixed volume pump. To reduce flow to the actuator, we must bypass a portion of the fluid over the relief valve. As we close the needle valve, pressure increases upstream. As we approach 1500 PSI, the relief valve begins to open, bypassing a portion of fluid to the reservoir. When flow control is used in a pressure compensated pump, fluid is not pushed over the relief valve. As pressure approaches the compensator setting of 1500 PSI, the pump will begin to de-stroke, reducing output flow. Flow control valves may be fixed, or non-adjustable, or adjustable. In addition, they may also be classified as throttling only or pressure compensated. The amount of flow through an orifice will remain constant as long as the pressure differential across the orifice does not change. When the pressure differential changes, the flow changes. Change in load or upstream pressure will change the pressure drop across the valve. Needle valves may be designated as non-compensated flow control or throttling valves. They are good metering devices as long as the pressure differential across the valve remains constant. We will show you how the speed of the cylinder is affected by the different loads when we use a non-compensated flow control. First, we place a 1,000 pound load. Watch the speed indicator to see how the cylinder responds. Now, we will place a 5,000 pound load. Watch the speed indicator to see how the cylinder responds. Now, let's place a 500 pound load. Watch the speed indicator to see how the cylinder responds. A pressure compensated flow control valve is designed to make allowances for pressure changes ahead or after the orifice. The pressure compensated flow control valve symbol adds a pressure arrow to the orifice. Notice that with a pressure compensated flow control valve, the speed of the cylinder does not change with the change in load. Meter in is the method of placing a flow control valve in such a way that fluid is restricted to the actuator. In this circuit, without a flow control valve, the cylinder extends and retracts at an unrestricted rate. When we place a flow control valve into the circuit, this flow control valve will restrict flow to the cylinder, slowing the extend rate of the cylinder. The check valve allows return flow to bypass the flow control when direction of flow is reversed. When we move the flow control to the other line, the cylinder extends at an unrestricted rate. We can restrict the flow to the cylinder so that it will retract at a reduced rate. The advantage to meter in is that it is very accurate with a positive load. However, when the load goes over center, the load becomes negative or overrunning. The load is no longer being controlled by the cylinder. As the load overruns, it causes the cylinder to cavitate. Although meter in is usually the best placement for controlling a constant speed because it also dampens flow and pressure transients, 
it may be required in some applications to meter out. To meter out, we simply change the direction that the flow is allowed to pass through the reverse check. This will cause the fluid to be metered as it leaves the actuator, which is opposite of meter in. An advantage of meter out is that it will prevent a cylinder from overrunning and consequently cavitating. A disadvantage to meter out can be pressure intensification. This can occur with a substantial differential area ratio between the rod and piston. When we meter out on the rod side of the cylinder without a load, the pressure is intensified on the rod side. This may damage the rod seals. Meter in or meter out has advantages and disadvantages. The application must determine the type of flow control valve placement. Finally, we'll close our work in this section with an overview of modular valves. Stack valves are bolted together in a compact stack, eliminating the need for external plumbing between components. By eliminating the pipes, tubes, and hoses typically used to interconnect the various valve components, the assembly is compact and free of potential leak points that occur with external plumbing. The standard subplate mounted directional control valves and cartridge style flow control pressure control and check valves mounted in sandwich valve blocks are used to create stack valve circuits. Each valve block has a mounting surface on the top and the bottom. Valve blocks that can only be mounted in one position have a chamfered O-ring seat around each port on the bottom mounting surface. Flow control valves can be rotated to change the metering direction of the valve. A thin sealing plate holds the O-rings in place, creating the sealing surface for the flow control valve. The valve stack is attached to a subplate or manifold using long bolts extending through the entire valve stack. Subplates and manifolds have a common supply, P, a common return, T, and work ports, A, B. The surface where the valves are mounted have a P, T, A, and B port for each actuator. The directional control valve is always located on the top of the stack. The relief valve should be placed at the bottom of the stack next to the subplate. Flow control valves and pressure control valves are placed between the relief valve and the directional control valve. Using proper procedures when assembling stack valves will produce a leak-free circuit. Clean and check all O-ring seats for damage. Center new O-rings in each seat and alternately tighten the mounting bolts until all bolts are properly torqued. A single valve stack can be mounted on a manifold block or subplate, while multiple valve stacks can only be mounted on a manifold block. Each valve stack would be used to control an actuator. Stack valves can be mounted on a manifold block in conjunction with circuits containing cartridge valves. Subplates and manifolds have a supply P port, a return T port, and A and B work ports which line up with corresponding P, T, A, and B ports on the mounting surface. Manifolds and subplates with X and Y ports can be supplied when using directional control valves that require an external pilot or external drain. Watch as the following components are converted to a schematic of a single stack that controls an actuator. The relief valve is placed next to the manifold to provide protection to the circuit. Pressure and flow controls are sandwiched in between the relief valve and the directional control valve. The directional control valve, which only has one mounting surface, is always at the top of the valve stack.
This schematic represents a system of three valve stacks mounted to a four-station manifold. The alternating dot and dash lines are enclosure lines. Each component outlined by an enclosure line represents a module with its internal passages. A blanking plate is used to block the ports of the unused station. There are four flow paths through each valve stack. The pressure and return passages through the stack assembly connect the pressure and return ports of the directional control valve to the respective ports on the manifold. The A and B work passages through the stack assembly connect the work ports of the directional control valve to the ports of the actuator. The system relief valve is located in the stack closest to the common supply and return ports. Stack valves are available in four ISO sizes. The ISO size O2 valve has a maximum pressure rating of 215 bar and a flow rating of 30 liters per minute. The ISO size O7 valve has a maximum pressure rating of 315 bar and a flow rating of 200 liters per minute. Cartridge valves can be used to perform flow control, pressure control, and directional control, load holding, and logic functions. They are a very compact design that must be installed into special cavities in valve blocks or manifolds. Cartridge valves used in combination with a manifold can be used to create a common circuit free of potential leaks associated with external plumbing. Cartridge valves can be divided into two design categories, screw-in and slip-in. The screw-in style cartridge valve uses a threaded base to secure the valve in the cavity. Screw-in cartridges use either a spool, poppet, or ball valve element. The spool element can be used for two-way, three-way, or four-way flow functions, while the poppet and ball elements provide for only a two-way flow function. Screw-in cartridge valves are typically used in low-flow systems where the flow is 35 gallons per minute or less. Some of the available screw-in valve configurations are check valve, relief valve, needle valve, solenoid-operated directional control valve, and manually operated directional control valves. Slip-in cartridge valves use an insert consisting of a poppet, spring, seals, and a sleeve, which slips into a cavity machined into a manifold block. A cover assembly bolted to the manifold block secures the insert in the manifold. The cover assembly usually contains one or more internal flow paths which allow the cartridge valve to interact with another valve in the manifold to create a specific function within the manifold. A directional control valve used to control the function of a slip-in cartridge can be mounted on the surface of an interface cover. Some cover assemblies also contain other options such as orifices, stroke adjusters, or a direct acting relief valve to create additional valve functions. These control covers function like a pilot section of a two-stage valve, while the slip-in cartridge functions like the main stage of a two-stage valve. Slip-in cartridges are typically used in circuits with flows of 30 gallons per minute or more. The poppet element of the slip-in cartridge is available in several area ratios. The first poppet has a 1 to 1 area ratio. The second has a 1 to 1.1 ratio. The third has a 1 to 2 area ratio. And the last poppet has a 1 to 2 area ratio with metering notches. Notice how the symbols are drawn to show the difference in area ratios. The last ratio also shows the metering notches. The ports are typically labeled A, B, and AP. A and B are the work ports, and AP is the pilot port. The pressure at each port, area ratios, and spring force will determine whether the valve will be open or closed. This schematic represents a cylinder being controlled by four slip-in cartridge valves, each of which is controlled by a directional control valve. By actuating or deactuating the directional control valves in different combinations, 
12 potential flow path combinations are possible. Several examples are Energizing valves 2 and 4 will allow flow from the P port to the A port and return flow from the B port to the T port so the cylinder will extend. Energizing valves 1 and 3 will allow flow from the P port to the B port and return flow from the A port to the T port so the cylinder will retract. Energizing valves 2 and 3 will create what is called a regenerative circuit which will cause an increase in the cylinder extend rate. Flow is from port P to port A with the return flow from port B combining with the flow going to port A. With all four valves de-energized, the cylinder will be held in the position where it stopped. Pressure from the A port of each directional control valve holds the respective cartridge valve closed. This blocks both the A and B ports of each cartridge valve. Since they are indeed check valves, they have zero leakage, so there will be no cylinder drift. Energizing all four valves will cause the P, T, A, and B work ports to be in common or open to each other. This will allow pump flow to return to the tank and the cylinder to float. In accordance with ISO 7368 or DIN 24324, slip-in cartridge valve configurations are rated by size in millimeters. This table shows valves for slip-in cartridges ranging in size from 16 millimeters to 100 millimeters. Each valve has a nominal flow rating and is measured as flow through the valve at a pressure drop of 72 psi. For example, at 72 psi, a 25 millimeter valve would have a nominal flow rating of 119 gallons per minute. Manifold blocks should be thoroughly cleaned before installing cartridge valves. New manifold blocks may have metal chips and other contaminants left in the cavities and passages from the machining process. Prior to assembling, the manifold block should be flushed repeatedly. Next, compressed air should be blown through all ports and passages and each opening wiped clean with a lint-free rag.